the practice of tribunals appointing their own experts is generally rare. Where there is incongruity between the different experts as provided by the parties, you know, it's a common practice to hot tub the experts to try to understand how their different arguments can coalesce or even to invite the experts to provide a joint statement or report. That being said, as we run through this, you'll see a lot of similarities. The expectations of a tribunal appointed expert are very similar to that of a party appointed expert because as we go back and underscore, the obligation overall of each expert is to the tribunal regardless of which party appointed them, meaning either the tribunal or a party. So tribunal is usually going to consult with the parties if they're going to appoint their own expert. And so the rule guides us at Article 6 that the tribunal may appoint one or more independent experts to report on specific issues, issues that may, not, may need more clarity. There are two main traditions of mediation. The first is what I might call the intuitive uh, informal traditional form of mediation, which has been around forever, since the beginning of humankind. And the second is a more recent phenomenon, and it is what I would call a professionalized, re increasingly regulated form of mediation, which really came out of the ADR movement, which began in the United States in the 1970s, took hold in common law countries, initially, and then also in civil law countries, and now is a worldwide phenomenon. Now, in this course, I, I will be focusing on professional mediation, but I just want to say a few words about the intuitive traditional form of mediation and its differences and similarities um, compared to professional or modern contemporary mediation, if you like. The most basic way to create your arbitral tribunal is to look at the arbitration clause, right? That's going to tell you what the parties had intended at the time the contract. In the case of investor state, the treaty was negotiated. Uh, that should hopefully give you criteria on the number of arbitrators, the qualifications, and things of that nature. Now, one practical tip, when you are negotiating a contract, make sure that your arbitration clause is not pathological. That is, you don't make such a fundamental mistake when you draft it that a court or any other decision maker who is asked to look at the arbitration clause looks at the arbitration clause and concludes that there's nothing that can be done. There's an error that is so fundamental. Most arbitral institutions will give you best practices and will give you recommended clauses. <laughs>